Denias. Oh! oh my God, this is an insane game. Jaworski splits the defense to floater. It does. A story that could have ended here, but didn't. Yes, oh, that is the correct call. My goodness. Nigel Cook will shoot two here. Oh, this is crazy. I am out of words. Well, if you understand the uh, definition of intensity, that's what that rivalry is. In one word, it's intense. I think it's familiarity. It's wanting to get one over on your, your neighbors, your rivals, your club teammates. It's so many of those different things of when you're so, when you're so close, you then want to get that. It's almost like a, in a sibling kind of way where you're that close that you want to get one over on, on that opponent. So Spring Ford is comprised of Spring City, Royers Ford, Limerick, Oaks, and a little piece of Collegeville. Perky Owen Valley is made up of Trap, Schwanksville, Skipback, and a larger portion of Collegeville. Springford has Anna Marie's, and that local Applebee's, Perky Owen Valley, has the Trap Tavern, and I'd say the Collegeville Diner. Perky Owen Valley is made up of about 6,000 students, something like that, and Springford has about 7,000 students. They're very similar school districts and have very similar people with similar backgrounds. The proximity of, of this rivalry is really what keeps the kids going. You know, in our youth sports around the areas, our PV uh, athletes and the Springford athletes can play together against each other a lot of times. And I think due to those reasons, we've developed this rivalry to want to win and to beat the other team. Key thing is you're, you're growing up with these kids, you're playing t-ball with them, you're playing, you're playing uh, Pop Warner with them, you're playing club sports with them all the way through up into middle school. And then once you hit middle school, that's where you separate and when you uh, and into high school, too. So the familiarity is there. Kids grow up next door to one another right across the street or there's township lines all around where, you know, there's some PV guys and there's some Springboard guys. And knowing that the other one's working hard, I, I think it, it's always made you step up your game in, in really in more good ways than not. You start with football and football is sort of that that totem pole or that pillar that everything else builds around. Well I think every year it gets uh, a little better than it was the year before and um, the student bodies have really embraced it and I think that's where all the energy comes from. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of times where PV won this game. Uh, Springford used to beat us up and um, you know, I would say starting in 96, and then we had a PAC championship team in 1998. Uh, we went on a run there in the early 2000s where we were winning this game often. And since, it's been very back and forth. You know, going into the 2015 game, uh, we were both 9-0. and And um, we both had pretty good teams. We both had district aspirations. Um, we both were, uh, you know, very similar in how we played. And going into the game, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger, obviously because of the records, but also because of, you know, the rivalry that was there. Uh, I got called by Dr. Nugent down to his office, and I had no idea what was going on. And I, I went down to his office, and it turns out that um, the PIAA had received an anonymous phone call uh, that alleged that the Springford program was giving players performance enhancing drinks prior to the game and so prior to all of our games. So we had to make a decision, we obviously were not, uh, but we had to make a decision uh, to um, whether or not we were going to continue with some of our pregame ceremonial things that we that we did, uh, we have a pretty good idea of of who that was, um, but uh, ultimately uh, it was just 
you know, a crazy, crazy thing. We had a nice football team. Uh, Steven Sturm was our quarterback. Uh, Justin Jaworski, both as juniors. In 2015, we did, we did a nice football team. The amount of people that were there before six o'clock was, was astounding. I've never seen a stadium that pat that quick. And you know, to walk out there on Friday night, uh, whether we're here or over at our place uh, in front of, you know, four or five, in some cases, eight, 9,000 people uh, when we play at McNally, um, it's, it's, it's something you have to experience. As we know, the atmosphere of this game is like none other in this area. That is the game for atmosphere. But that game was crazy too. We went, we didn't play a very good first half. We went at halftime. I think we were tied though. We got the ball in the 20 and the first play of the second half, Stone Scarcelli went 80 yards for a touchdown and, um, and we never trailed after that. Break the tackle, he's got the edge. Stone Scarcelli gonna take this to the house, to the 30, 20, 10, five, touchdown, wow. spring forward. Stone Scarcelli, 80 yard touchdown run to the house to start the second half. What a way to come out swinging, holy moly. You know, and I think we felt confident coming into that game and we, we knew that this was for the PAC championship and there was a lot on the line. We had um, a hard time moving the ball. Um, their defensive line that year was outstanding. Um, which it usually is, uh, you know, they sit in their 4-3. You know, they, they played outstandingly. Uh, they played outstandingly on both sides of the ball, scored just enough, and uh, it was certainly a big win for them. There's been countless good renditions of the Spring Ford Perk Valley rivalry in football. And you will take the handoff, and he stays on his feet. And he's being pushed into the he's end zone. In. Spring for a touchdown. And Polo drops. And he's in for a touchdown. Third and short. Ball on the 27. And Kohler looking deep. And he's got it. He was in an excellent position. Here's the tie break tie right here. Two point conversion again. He's at there at the Rams 20. They hand this one off to Mocha. He's in for the touchdown. They just need to get the markers. Uh, that ball is incomplete, and that will unfortunately end the night for the Springboard Rams as the PB is going to complete their amazing fourth quarter comeback. It's a day of Faye. He's in for the touchdown. What a start for the Spring Ford Rams. They go to Teets. Teets has got room. He breaks through. Touchdown, Nicholas Teets. He's staying on his feet. Kept, that, kept those feet moving. Now Kohler is going to take it in for the touchdown. Pressure. He's going to run. And he's going to take it in. Should do it here at Coach McNelly Stadium. The Springford Rams win rival week 27 to 13. There's been great soccer, the boys lacrosse uh, rivalries, girls basketball for a few years. There's it, it transcends so many different sports. It, it starts with the football, but it continues with all the different sports. And I think that's a key piece of it too. So a lot of emphasis has always been placed on football and basketball and, and lacrosse, but one of the subsets of the spring forward and PB rivalry really came in the softball. And these two programs were really good and still are really good, but they were really good back in 2015 through 2017. You had Megan Kern for spring forward, you had Abby wild at PV and, those two really went toe to toe with each other, and a lot of PAC championships came down to PV and Springford. Another one that comes to mind is um, boys soccer championship from 2018, I believe. Which it's funny with with boys soccer. There's been um, 
the Springford Perk Valley rivalry comes and goes, if you will. Um, it's not a consistent as we are the top two teams in in the league, but there's been blips here and there, if you will. Uh, as I was looking back, 2013, Spring Ford at home beats Perk Valley for the PAC championship in penalty kicks. Uh, but anyways, this, this 2018 game was a special game because um, Spring Ford's trying, trying, trying to get over the hump of, for some reason, they just can't seem to win the PAC championship. And Perk Valley's coming off of a season that uh, they'd made states. They were the first team out of the pack to make the state tournament ever, which is remarkable in and of itself. Uh, and so th these two forces are coming to a head in this game. And in this one, Perk Valley got over the top and won their first pack championship in 17 years. And it was a special one on a personal level. Um, when I first arrived at the Mercury, the first person in this area that I met was uh, Perk Valley head coach Bob McCabe and so to see him get over the top for the first time in 17 years with his son as a senior um, that special moment for them was um, one that I especially remember of the rivalry too. The, the boys lacrosse rivalry as well uh, in terms of memorable games I think two, two years ago the uh, boys lacrosse championship Spring Ford has been the, the boys lacrosse program in the pack and this area for as long as I've been here, as a matter of fact, that um, when, when I first, one of the first sports I started covering was boys lacrosse and literally every year, Spring Ford comes out with the championship. And for a long time, Owen J. Roberts was the primary rival, but over time, especially in recent years, Perk Valley has been chasing, 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 trying to get that spot from Spring Ford. And every single time, Spring Ford just finds a way, finds a way, finds a way. It's a rivalry that I think is now the decisive one amongst all the sports of these are the top two teams and they're battling it out in boys lacrosse every year. Phoenixville had, you know, all the hype, you know, they, they came in, um, you know, with Christian Kelly and, and a great supporting cast and Upper Marion had uh, a younger Matt Fall at that time as well, who was a division one prospect and, and they had, um, you know, four, three or four kids that went on to play college basketball at that point. So I think those were the trendy, trendy picks, but, you know, in our locker room, we had Ganias who again, you know, was kind of under the radar because he didn't have a, a, a standout junior year that some of the other players did. Um, but we had Nigel Cook, who um, individually I think was the best on the ball defender in the league. Um, and he really pushed Gennai some practice and those two as a guard tandem are, were as good as it got, not only in our league, but um, you can argue throughout District 1. I knew that year uh, we were we were on our way up. Um, I, I knew we had some good pieces that had logged some experience, taking some lumps along the way. The year before on purpose, um, we had a super difficult schedule. And in all of District 1, I, I think we had like the third or fourth most difficult schedule um, out there to get us ready for the next two years. So going in, you know, I, I knew Justin and Sean and Hogan were going to be sort of nice junior pieces. I knew with Cullen and Sean and Ethan, you know, we had sort of expectations of that year that, you know, if we do what we need to, we can certainly compete with, with anybody. That year we started off terribly. We were like two and six or two and seven to start the year. I forget what it was. So things weren't looking real great. I think we played Springford at home and they beat up, beat up on us a little bit. Springford was the favorite to win the pack um, pretty much from the beginning of the year. And they had the most talent uh, and they were the best team in the beginning of the year. But what, what happened with Perk Valley is that at the end of the year, they really started playing much better. Uh, Springford won the first meeting uh, at PV, but PV actually came to Springford and won the second meeting. And, and they had slowed the game down. They were playing a possession style of offense. They were running through a lot of sets and really draining clock and shortening games. 
Uh, and then obviously they had Jaworski, who was who was the the best player on the court, uh, and you know he's having a great career over at Lafayette. With him, uh, you know anything is possible. And so him and, and they really shortened their bench. They were going six guys, maybe seven, uh, and and they were able to really notch a couple of big wins and get to this championship game. I believe they beat Phoenixville in the semifinal, uh, and then all of a sudden, you have you know a clash of two teams. Uh, you know, the kind of the, the rubber match. And I remember them beating us on senior day, um, which really heightened the rivalry and kind of put a chip on our shoulder to get them back. And hopefully that will see them again to see who wins the series. Um, and thankfully that did in the championship game. Well, good morning, Berkeley Valley. As you know, today is championship Tuesday. Tonight at Springfield at 7 o'clock. The Pac-10 championship game, Perkiman Valley against the Lambs of Royers Ford. Here are some student section guidelines on how to be the rowdiest possible student section. Orange out. 7 o'clock start time. Doors open at 5.30. We should all be there by 4.45. This is how Spring Ford is set up. Very unintelligent, okay, because there's just something wrong over there. So there's five sections, two short ones at the end and three large ones in the middle. We will occupy two large ones and one small one, all orange. The lambs will be over here and they will be smaller and quieter than us. We were really confident. I mean, if you remember the game before that, we had just knocked off Phoenixville and Phoenixville was undefeated. They had Christian Kelly, obviously a great player. He'll be a pro basketball player soon. So, I mean, we were really confident. We were hot. We won a bunch of games in a row. I mean, we're playing our rival in the championship. So, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I would say for our entire team, we were we were pretty confident and looking forward to that game. It was it was pretty crazy. Uh, you know, like every kid dreams about playing in a championship game, no matter how big the stakes are. And um, as a collective, there are definitely some nerves uh, the week building up to it and on game day. But um, – we were confident in the work that we put in during the season and that we would give it our all win or lose. So it definitely was a big event. Um, you know, there, I remember the fans, the fan uh, Twitter account were uh, going back and forth from Springford and PV. So it definitely, it definitely was uh, something to remember. So championship game, they always feel different. And I'm sure coach Sally will say kind of the same thing. Like a playoff game is a playoff game. A championship game is just different. And, you know, going in, you know, I, I liked, I thought it was going to be a good game. You know, anybody could have won that one. There's so many people here that they turned away people. Uh, that was, that was just the atmosphere. And that doesn't happen very often in any sport. So when you get that electricity, um, it, it, it really set the tone for the whole evening. Uh, you you kind of knew you were, you were going to have a chance to have a special night, a special call. Uh, early in the game, it was it was very back and forth. And in fact, um, you know there were definitely some jitters and some nerves, and that's to be expected with a, with a big high school game. You know, going in the game, you expect to have all kinds of like everyone's a little too amped up, missing shots or a little long on their shots. You know, quick feet and walks and turnovers. And and then I think both teams they settle into themselves. The first quarter is nerves and energy and excitement and then everybody kind of settles into their game plan scouting report okay now go run your stuff and i thought that's really what what happened um you know it, baskets were tough to come by um it was kind of expected that the game would start out pretty slow with everyone getting their you know championship jitters out of the way um we told ourselves just to you know calm down and Shots will eventually fall. Shoot or shoot. Um, that was our mentality. Um, PV always played with like a slow pace, like holding the ball for a long periods of time and trying to really like drag the game out um, where we were the complete opposite, always trying to attack uh, offensively and be aggressive on defense. So it was just an adjustment that we had to make. And eventually the pieces uh, were put together and shots started falling later in the game. First half was what, 2016? So low scoring, not much offense that kind of favored us. We want it low scoring and want low possessions because we know, you know, we, we have some guys that can knock down shots and just takes a couple of threes to go in and we're kind of where we're kind of where we want them. I mean, I can say for me personally, I was terrible through the first three quarters. I think I had like eight points or something heading into the fourth quarter. I mean, couldn't make a shot. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're they're high school kids out there and and I think they 
you know, wanted it so bad that maybe they were pressing and trying a little bit hard, too hard, but not Cam. Cam Cam's, uh, he's, he's a smooth cat. Cam Reed was a big, big influence for Springford when they were struggling. PV was playing some great blanket defense, as was Springford, and uh, Cam Reed came up big, like I mentioned, with those 14 points and 10 rebounds to, to kind of settle Springford down in, in the scoring and rebounding column. All the shots that were made were constantly back and forth that last minute and a half, and they were all to give yourself the lead. It wasn't like it tied it up. It was PV led, then spring four led, then PV led, then spring four led. So it was tremendous in terms of that atmosphere that you just couldn't believe how free flowing the game became, as grinding as it was for the first, say, 30 minutes. The last two minutes were just an absolute gunslinger. I'm coming down and I'm firing away and freed up, not thinking about anything but making it. And my goodness, both teams were just incredible with the shots that they made down the stretch. I mean, the three that I hit. So, I mean, we run this play in Maryland. And I think everybody in the universe knows to play Maryland. Like, I, I shallow cut across the court. I get a back door. We've been running it all year. I mean, everybody knows it. For some reason, not a lot of people could stop it. So we're running that same play on the three that I hit. But I look at my buddy Hogan, who was throwing the pass, and I was like, yo, I'm going to fake the back door. Like, they know it's coming. I'm faking the back door. So I fake that back door and get the three. And I think that put us up two. And we're all excited. I'm guarding Macanias, and he comes down full speed. And I just backed up too far, and he pulls a three. So really when we called that timeout, I was more mad than anything else. I felt like I let us down backing up too far like that. That was just stupid. Like I didn't know the situation. We're up two. Obviously you can't give up a three. That, that's things that we have gone over on practice. Um, more times than not as a coaching staff, in those situations, we're going to let our best players be best players. Um, so much when you call the timeout and then you set it up and – you know, now you're kind of giving them an opportunity to set a different defense, to do something maybe you're not prepared for. Um, so we kind of like in the flow of a game, prepare for that uh, situation where, hey, if they score, this is what we're going to do. So that, that wasn't anything new. Um, but I also don't think there was any doubt who was going to get the ball, who was going to take the shot, and who, who was going to um, have the final say, and that was Ganias. I mean, I know we, we were down after Justin made that three. Um, and honestly, to this day, that whole moment after is still blurred to me. Um, I'm honestly lucky I made that shot because it definitely would have been a, a head scratch all around on that decision if I missed. Um, but no, I was, I was confident in my shot. Um, I always have been. And in that moment, I was confident and just pulled the trigger. And all I remember is the crowd going nuts. Uh, but definitely one of the best moments and best shots in my uh, basketball career. When I called timeout, we walked in, and it wasn't even like a question of what should we run. We've been planning for these types of moments all season long. My whole thing was give me the ball, and we're going to go out my way. So I was shooting that ball no matter what, regardless of who was guarding me, just because I felt like I let our team down on defense, so I wanted to get it back for us on offense. Uh, Coach Tally was just trying to keep us composed, um, saying the game's not over yet. We still have we still have to play one full possession of defense, play solid defense without fouling with the remaining seconds of the game. Ganias and Nigel uh, were going to deny Jaworski. We we're going to double him. And it could have been whoever at that point. We did not want Jaworski to get the ball and go the length of the court because um, you know, he's a different type of player than, than uh, this league has really seen in a long time. So if we were going to go down, it could have been the two through five guys or whoever was in the game. Um, if they're going to beat us, we'd want that. What was cool to watch was that even though the play has multiple options, when you watch back the play, not a lot of guys ran it well at all because I think in that moment, the guys trusted in Justin enough to make the, the right decision. Initially, I want to say Nigel was guarding me. I don't remember exactly. 
but I know I wanted to catch the ball going downhill because we didn't have that much time. We had to go the full length of the court and I wanted to get to my right hand. Just obviously that's my dominant hand. So I started on the left side and I loop across the baseline so I can catch it going downhill down the right sideline. And then I know Cam came over to double team me. So I split their double team. And then I really wasn't sure how much time was on the clock, but like anybody who's watched me play knows like shooting that floater is like one of my favorite shots ever. Like I work on it all the time. So, I mean, as I'm doing that move, honestly, what's going through my head is just like, dude, you've done this a million times in practice on your own, all these workouts, like just do what, just do what you've been working on. So I shot the floater and when I shot it, I thought it was short. So I was kind of scared when it hit the front rim. And then, I mean, thank God it went in. Jaworski splits the defense to floater. It goes! It goes! So on the floor, I'm watching, I'm watching everything going. I see Jaworski hit his floater and absolute chaos after that. So Jaworski hits it, the crowd erupts. And then all of a sudden you see Nigel Cook heave up a desperation that almost went in. People forget that that shot almost went in and none of it, there would have been a moot point because that would have been one of the best shots that we've ever seen. I mean, there were definitely probably people that were not happy with me at all, like 100%. Um, I mean, I wasn't the first one on the court, just for the record, um, but I was definitely first 10 probably, but I don't know. People were definitely mad at me. Uh, it is what it is. I mean, there was like probably like two, 300 people over there. Like, there's really nothing that I could have done, but I mean, the buzzer went off and we stormed the court and we thought we won, so. We were, we were kind of like, you gotta be kidding me. Cause the, the emotional drop off of that happening, of Jaworski hitting that shot was like, you got it, like, are you kidding? Like, and I didn't know what was happening. I was so, I was like, that's it, it's over. Like, thanks for playing, good night. They were so close, districts is next week. Talk about basketball later. I was ready to like get up and leave. And I'm sitting there and I, the whispers start. The whispers from this side, the, the refs are meeting, they're yelling at them, you know, Todd Reagan on the mic, everybody get back to the, to the, you know, to the stands. And the whispers start like, that's against the rules. They went on the court before the game was officially over. That, that could be a technical. I don't know if someone heard them up in the booth say it. I don't know where the whisper started. I mean, I remember I was grabbed by one of the security guards, my buddy Jason, who was standing right next to me. He was like, he grabbed him first and then he like grabbed my sleeve and I just kind of like shrugged him off. Like as people were like coming down around me from the stands. And I just remember running on the court and it was a excellent feeling. Anytime you see the referees kind of huddle for as long as they did and, and talk and, and whatnot, you think that that's the moment where they're gonna make the call, right? If you're gonna wave it off, it tends to be a situation where you immediately say, okay, even if the rule says this, you know, it's up to our discretion, we're not gonna, change the impact of a title game because fans ran onto the floor. But they clearly, uh, you know, there had been multiple calls over the loudspeaker uh, from the public address not to come on the court. Uh, the referees knew the situation, but they made the decision to, to enforce the rule there and give the two shots. When, when, they wait, when they meet for as long as they do, you start to think, this is actually gonna happen, whoa. And then, uh, you know, you see the referee turn to the bench and give the tee and the whole Springford side erupts and people are going absurd. And, and, uh, and I remember cutting off Dave Caldwell. That's a technical foul on Perky Omen Valley. They call the technical foul on Perky Omen Valley. Yes, oh, that is the correct call. My goodness. So regardless of what anybody says, the ref called the foul on the student section. He didn't call it on the bench. He didn't call it on our coach. He called it on the student section. One, one of our philosophies is like we always want to have a timeout. So there's rarely, rarely a game where we leave a game out of timeouts. And it's for situations like that. Um, and so I think we, you can never prepare for a crazy ending like that. But I think it benefited us to make sure, you know, we stuck to that having a timeout. So once the ball was in the air, the only thing I could think of was if this goes in, like you have to call a timeout. We need to get another shot at this because there wouldn't be enough time to get it in and let Matt be Matt. So at that point, you, we needed to call a timeout. So I was just hoping it wouldn't go in, um, but I was prepared and, uh, you know, t that if it did go in, we we're going to call a timeout.
The video of me slamming the table, um, the, I don't think I slammed the table at any point that season, but me walking over to the table was not uncommon practice, but the slam was, was very in the moment of uh, frustration. Cam Reed was our best foul shooter for the year. Um, he, he shot most of our technicals when there were technicals. Um, Ganias, I, I don't know if he told this story or not, but um, you know he was our, our captain, he was our um, leading scorer, he was the guy everybody looked to. Um, he didn't always shoot foul shots well under pressure, so I think he, we kind of said, all right, um, Matt's not gonna go to the line. I think that was a consensus right now. And Matt, we've talked about this, um, he knows he wasn't an option in that point. He did the hard part, and now you know that's why we have a team. Um, I think as a coaching staff, there was a consensus, let's make the first miss the second. Um, and let's see how this plays out in um, overtime. Matt, being the leader he is, um, without getting into too much of the personal details of the story, Nigel Cook kind of went through um, a tough 24 hours. And, um, you know, he was playing a little bit with a heavy heart. And um, Matt immediately came over and said, put Nigel on the line. So as a coach, you're kind of like, all right, our best player, our emotional leader is coming to the coach in the craziest of circumstances saying, put Nigel on the line. You know, as a coach, you know, I have the assistant coaches in my ear at that point. Um, you're going to take that, uh, that opportunity, and, and that's what we did. I was thinking about the enormity of the moment for Nigel. Um, and then when he missed the first one, I don't think I've ever felt more internal cheering for a guy than, than that moment in my lifetime because I was just like, please, Nigel, make this. Because I didn't want him to have to suffer through that. Okay at least the kids are going to decide here in overtime. So in a strange way, I was happy that the way it happened, that Nigel made the shot, and then it went into overtime, and it was, okay, here's we're going to put a few more minutes on the clock for overtime, and let's go play, and we'll decide, instead of having that official uh, question mark hanging over both teams. Honestly, I, from a coaching standpoint, I'm glad it came down to that point because uh, you'll never be able to convince me otherwise. You had four, four minutes to prove you're the better team. And that goes for both sides. Um, emotional, it was emotional for everybody. You know, it wasn't just an emotional deflating time for Park Valley. Yeah, it was. But again, it, it was an emotional scene for everybody. Um, so as a coaching staff, you know, we, you know, just talked to the kids about you know this is going to be talked about forever, and it should be, but we have four minutes right now to prove that we're the better team. And uh, we took advantage of that four minutes, and um, we jumped on them early and, you know, never let off the gas. You can say, oh, there was overtime. Like, yeah, give me a break. Like, you wouldn't have won an overtime either if you were on the other side. Um, that just, like, the emo pure emotion was just sucked out of it, and you just couldn't believe like, that, was, that that was happening to you in the moment. And I think kind of all of that, came out with the slam, like knowing like this is actually going to be taken from us. Like we earned it and it's going to be taken from us from an interpretive rule. And if you think about like the rule itself, like they caught it on the bench, right? Like, you know, for a fact, it's bogus, like the bench, like what, what do we do? Like nothing. So I make my way from that corner over to this corner here and I'm standing in front of our student section engaging with some of the upperclassmen who, who found themselves at the lower end of the bleachers leading the leading the cheering section and so forth taking on the uh, final few minutes of this game and I can't recall the exact sequence but I do believe there was some action over here at this side of the court very very little time left on the floor it might have even been a missed basket by Springford at that time as the clock was winding down. However, the clock did not fully expire. However, Perkyoma Valley student section and players had thought it did and began to storm the court. Now, we, we get a flood of students coming down here and the players here and it was right around this area where everybody was just on the floor and hugging and tackling each other. And I'm here 
keeping our fans back. As we notice those fans coming onto the floor, Dr. Nugent approaches the group that way. I approach the group this way. We make eye contact. Dr. Nugent and I look at each other and we look at the scoreboard and we recognize time was not expired. And as we were making gestures to each other saying, there's still time left. As we're trying to get the fans off the floor, the players back to the bench and this and that, and, and, and we get the player, the, the students sit back into this, and I am now picking up cell phones, shoes, glasses, whatever was laying on the floor. Uh, we get those back to the students, and it was at that point, now we have the referees over here by the scorer's table commiserating what just happened, right? It was at that time, a, a technical foul was called against Parkyoma Valley, which put one of our players, Nigel Cook, on the foul line with two shots. We're down by one. And I remember, Nigel misses the first free throw, but he makes a second free throw to send the game to overtime, and Springford wins the game. So it was, I remember it like it was yesterday. It's a shame it ended that way. I think the officials made the right call. I don't think they had a choice not to call that. But as, as a fan, as a fan, we never want to jeopardize what's happening on the field or the court. And unfortunately, that happened that night. Fortunately for us, we came out on the right side of it. Great game. Um, I'm sure you can, you can predict what I'm going to say. I don't agree with the call. Um, I think you let the players decide the game, so I definitely didn't like it. You know, officials are human beings. Uh, just like players and coaches, and, and um, I would say that technically the right call was made. I'm not sure that the appropriate call was made uh, at that particular um, time. Uh, to, to penalize kids who, you know, worked their rear ends off and, and, and uh, seemingly won the game deservedly, uh, with a technical at that stage for something that a student body did that had nothing to do with the basketball program is, is a shame. Fans still have to remember that they're not on the court, they're not part of the game. Um, I certainly would struggle with that if it were our kids, uh, that if the, the reverse was true, but I ultimately, um, it was hard to see, you know, you don't like to see that happen. Um, and I'm not here to say it was the right call or the wrong call. You just hate to see that happen. Uh, you hate to see a game affected by, by fans. So I think it is important that teachers are around the student sections to make sure that um, kids have a lot of fun. And I'm sure it is a, a ton of fun, but also, you know, don't make any huge mistakes like that that affect outcomes. Um. You know, here, based on the rule, it's the right call, but also within that rule, it gives you the opportunity to not make that call. So that's, you know, it depends on what side and where you're looking at it. For example, next, that weekend in the first round of districts, I forget where we were, um, where our boys had played, but Mr. Miscavige and I were at the game. We came out, we went on to, uh, I think it was Periscope at the time, and the same thing of a similar incident happened at PW and the referees put the students back in their seats, no technical assigned, and they just finished the game from that point. In high school sports, your, your dad is going to be one of the security guards or you're going to have someone, you're going to have volunteers who run the scorers table, volunteers to do security, volunteers to run your snack bar, your snack cart, the tickets. And you put a lot of pressure on uh, people like that, especially at the scorer's table. I know the Miscavages have done a tremendous job with everything that they do. And I wouldn't, there's never been a complaint against them and I would never put a complaint against them. And then, but you're asking these people to be a hundred percent right when it comes to clock management, to when that buzzer went off, to stopping that buzzer. You're asking these security guards who 
usually get paid nine or 10 bucks an hour as a part-time job to try and stop 400 kids from storming the court. It's hard. It's really hard. And I don't, I don't think that the referees should be, should have any different expectations. So if I don't think if the referee said no technical foul, I don't think anyone would have minded that you're going to have some referees who find, who, who try to go by the letter of the law and you can't blame them because technically they're right. But in the scheme of high school sports, having a level of nuance, I wouldn't say that it's, I wouldn't say that it makes it more fair, but having a level, level of nuance is important. Uh, I mean, it was soft. The buzzer went off, game's over. That's what it is. You know what I mean? Whether we, like, reverse scenario, what happens if it's the other way around? You know what I mean? Like, other scenario where the entire building, you know what I mean? Even though it was a neutral site game, it's at Spring Forward. So, like, reverse scenario, I don't know. Probably doesn't happen. You know what I mean? But who knows? You know, I think it's, it's probably the most iconic uh, high school basketball game I've ever attended or watched. Uh, I think that's definitely the legacy. You know, even the day after the game, I remember walking through the halls and people were, were you know, it was really the buzz of the day. And I remember, you know, I was defending Perk Valley and saying, look, like, you know, Springford won the game. They won, deserved to win in overtime. They were the better team. But it's impossible to ignore that if you're Perk Yeoman Valley, you got totally screwed by the refs, interjecting in a game and having the fans decide a game between two teams. I, I kind of going to take the Switzerland thing on it and stay neutral because I have a lot of great friends who are officials. I have a lot of great friends who are coaches, and we've all been in heat to the moment, and I get both sides. I get both sides where we're letting the kids decide. I get both sides uh, where you know officials want to call the game right and do the right thing and call it properly. So I get all of that stuff, and that led me to why I was so relieved when Nigel made that second free throw because I'm like, thank goodness now we've gotten through that. At least we're going to let it decide on the court here in overtime. And uh, Spring Ford uh, certainly did that uh, very, very well. It seems to me that if you're on the Perk Valley side, it was the wrong call. And if you're on the Spring Ford side, it was the right call. So, the, I mean, obviously, the, we could have won the game or lost the game. But in and of itself, the call still the incorrect call. It doesn't fit the timing of that moment. It doesn't fit the climate of that game. It doesn't fit the way in which players in competition should be punished or rewarded. So if our bench leaves the bench too early and runs on the floor, well, then we've made the mistake. If a coach yells out profanity and the referees hear him, then he's made the mistake. But, but in that moment, the PB basketball players and the Springford basketball players, neither group did anything wrong. In fact, they, they, they played a, a wonderful game of basketball. So then when people that weren't on the team directly impacted how the game played out, that 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 doesn't belong in sports. I so I honestly didn't know that they were going to do that until I think my dad might have sent a picture of it to me when he was in the gym, like before, um, as they like they were going back into the to the school to kind of prep for the upcoming school year. So I personally didn't even know that they were going to put one up. Um, I think it's kind of funny. Like, I think it's more so funny and like being a little petty than it is like actually serious. first meeting between the two teams and Springford had lost a lot of talent they weren't quite as good Perk Valley was seen as the best team but Springford was was definitely not you know way below Perk Valley but this was supposed to be Perk Valley's year 
And the student section said, we're going to do a silent night. We're going to wait until Springford gets to, it was either five or 10 points. Uh, and I think Perk Valley came up and, and blitzed them like 20 to two. Uh, and it was just, you know, you're sitting there and you're just like, this game is like the amalgamation of all the anger that Perk Valley had from the year before and just coming in and unleashing it on Springford. Uh, and they absolutely torched uh, Springford in that game. And even if it was different kids, it was the same school. And for me, that was 100% what it was, was I wanted revenge for that, for that game. We ended up... Um beating Upper Marion, who, um, you know, they had some injury issues with Matt Fall, uh, but he came back for the playoffs. We got through that game and ultimately got what we wanted, which was a rematch with Park Valley. It was just as ugly in the beginning. I think Justin opened up one for nine the first half. I think it was 18 to 16 at, at halftime. And I think both of us, the game – because usually games are, are personal. They're for your team. They're for yourself. They're for, you know, your families. Th that game just had so much aura around it uh, that, again, it, it took the whole first half to settle in and, and get ourselves together. I want to say we were up six pretty late in that game. And um, there's a couple plays, you know, as coaching staff, we talk about all the time. You know, so, so I was certainly glad to see it. Uh, I, I don't want to sound any layer of arrogance, but I think the players expected that of themselves that year, and I, I thought I expected that of them. Perk Valley was definitely a better team than Springford that year, but even that Pac championship game uh, still came down to the last three minutes, as it seemed to always do when, when, when Perk Valley and Springford met up in a big game. But, but Perk Valley was able to get their revenge, and uh, I know for a lot of the people who had graduated the year before, even though they weren't a part of it, PV beating Springford that next year was big for for them and, and kind of a, a gotcha moment. We decided to, you know, so there were a couple different things. There were all kinds of crazy decisions that had to be made going into um, the fall 2020. And one of those decisions was, you know, to how, how to handle the schedule. So the coaches in the pack all agreed and passed along to our 80s that we would be fine if we didn't have a uh, scrimmage. And then that turned into no non-league games. So we were sitting there looking at PV uh, as our opening game. And, um, you know, some people asked me, did we want to play that game first? And I said, absolutely, because we didn't know what was going to happen each week subsequent to that. So if, if something would have happened, you know, where we lose a game or the season's over or shut down or whatever, all of our kids and our coaches, and I'm sure they felt the same way, we wanted to make sure we had that game in. So um, we, Coach Heist and I talked about it and both agreed, like we could have had the option to bump the game to the end, but we wanted to play it up front in case, you know, anything happened. We didn't know what the next day, much less the next week would look like. So um, it was very strange because it was the first game and usually if that was say that was the first game in a normal year you know there would have been seven eight thousand people there and um, it was eerily quiet and uh, it was just you know it was a weird weird thing and hopefully um, that water is all under the bridge by 2021 season oh it was like the twilight zone uh, it was it was so weird um, you know usually in a normal year by the time our buses get over here, the stands are filled. 
I mean, there's a couple thousand people roaming around already, and, and you can just start feeling your blood pressure, your, uh, blood pressure uh, rise a little bit. Um, but this year it was weird. I, I felt like I was back, you know, no disrespect to youth football, but I felt like I was coaching eighth grade again, you know, where there was just no fans, and it just certainly wasn't the same um, atmosphere. And uh, I know that I missed it, and I know that our kids missed it for sure. So to be there with a couple hundred parents was was a different different sort of animal. And yeah, th this year's football game was not one for the neutral. Uh, it was it was a one-sided affair. The score looked more flattering than it actually was. And it was it was curious too because Springford, who's aired it out for year after year after year, is now a ground and pound team and we're grinding down Perk Valley and it was it was all disorienting I guess if you look at this year's football game but it obviously led led to great things for the Spring Ford football team this year. I think it's it's the premier rivalry in the area really when when i think of the top rivalries in the area i think of spring Ford, perk valley and pottstown pottsgrove which i think pottstown pottsgrove is more a circumstance of proximity as much as anything whereas spring Ford, perk yeoman valley is high achievement in in each each season sport after sport in so many different ways that it's it's as much the fabric of pack championships as as any other rivalry is. It's so nice to play the Spring Ford PV game every year just because we're like rivals and like our schools are rivals. So it's always really exciting and doesn't matter who it is, every year it comes back and everyone's always excited to play each other because there's that rivalry and it's just always a very exciting and intense game. Oh, that's amazing to, to be at a school like this. I have such a rich rivalry between uh, two local crosstown rivals, it's great. And um, as much as it's amazing, it's also a, a, a big responsibility. Uh, the entire week before uh, a, a rivalry game, you can feel the pressure and well, as well as excitement to, to um, perform at the highest level um, in that game. Cause you know, it's just, it's gonna be a physical battle and uh, everyone in the crowd is gonna be, you know, rooting crazy. And uh, yeah, you feel that sense of honor that you need to, to, to win the game for, for everyone else at school since they're there to support you and uh, it, it, it's, it's a big game. It's really, it's really the best thing you, could, you can ask for as a, a high school athlete, you wanna come here, you wanna compete and you want the fans to get into it. So it's amazing knowing that um, you know, the, the schools here have such rich, rich history in the sense of people long, long ago were competing and having such an intense rivalry and you know that people furthermore in, in the future that will surpass us will also have that intense rivalry, it's great. To me, it's one of the best rivalries in the state of Pennsylvania.
Hi everyone, thank you for watching our documentary. I'm Matt Dunn, this is John Zawizlak. Uh, you might recognize John from all of our Ram Country television broadcasts. But yeah, this documentary really evolved into a life of its own. It was inspired by The Last Dance back when we watched it in April, but after talking to people, interviewing through the editing process, it really evolved into something more. Uh, me playing soccer, John running cross country and track, we already had an interest in the rivalry, but talking to all these people, and we really want to thank all of them because they really heightened this and made it what it is. Uh, we did the interviews right here, and we just want to express all that gratitude to the people who took the time to do this, especially in a challenging year like this one. Yeah, thank you so much for watching. It'll be really fun to see where this rivalry goes throughout these next couple of decades. Thank you again. Thanks, guys.